Good morning. Was it was it a crazy week this week? Uh, last week in Florida, in this world, uh, I want to tell you guys I've been gone a couple weeks, um, but it's always great to come back to Summer Church or Homestead and feel the love as you walk in the doors and see everybody. So it's really cool. Let's uh, please close your eyes. I'm going to pray. Dear Father, I want to pray for the community of Helen and. I'm sorry, the community of Estelle, Florida, and Florida that had to deal with Helen and built in the hurricane. I want to pray for the family. Please give them strength that were impacted. And Father, I just pray that you look over all of them and heal us quick and, and just help all of us to be there for them. I know that we got some good things going on some of youth that are going to be happening um, in those communities. So, uh, Lord, just thank you. Thank you again for your son who died on the cross and resurrected for us. And we know it's only you. We can't do anything. And we thank you, Lord. Thank you for being an awesome God. And all God's children said, amen. I want to read to you guys Isaiah 12, 2 through 6, because I think it, it fits to, to the sermon today. And it says, Behold, God is my salvation. I will trust and will not be afraid. For the Lord God is my strength and my song, and he has become my salvation. With joy you will draw water from the wells of salvation, and you will say in that day, Give thanks to the Lord, call upon his name, Make known his deeds among the peoples. Proclaim that his name is exalted. Sing praises to the Lord. For he has done gloriously. Let his, be, let his name be known in all of the earth. Amen. Shout and sing for joy, O inhabitant of Zion. For great in your midst is the Holy One of Israel. Thank you. All right, church, if you would stand with us. And let's praise Jesus this morning. Amen. Amen. And sing together in days of peace. In days of peace. In days of rest. In times of
Open up my eyes so I may see that you have made these ways for me. Open up my eyes so I may see that you, my God, will walk with me. Amen. And oh, what peace that I have found where praise an awesome God who sees and knows all things. Amen. He knew from the beginning that we would need a savior and he paved the way that we might know who the father is, that we may be brought back to him. Amen. Let's continue to worship that great God who knows all things, who has covered all things and who is above all things. Amen. We sing together, there is a fountain. There is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins. And sinners plunged beneath that blood lose all their guilty stains. Lose all their guilty stains. Lose all their guilty stains. And sinners plunge beneath that flood, lose all their guilty stains. The dying thief rejoiced to see that fountain in his day. And there may I, though vile as he, wash all my sins away. Wash all my sins away. Wash all my sins away. And there may I, though vile as he, wash all my sins away. Dear dying lamb, thy precious blood shall never lose its power till all the ransomed church of God be saved to sin no more. Be saved to sin no more. Be saved to sin no more. Till all the ransomed church of God be safe to sin no more. Their sins by faith. Their sins by faith. I saw the stream, thy flowing wounds supply. Redeeming love has been my theme and shall be till I die. And shall be till I die. And shall be till I die. Redeeming love has been my theme and shall be till I die. for this being 
almost every time lies silent in the grave. Then in a nobler, sweeter song, I'll sing thy power to save. I'll sing thy power to save. I'll sing thy power to save. Then in a nobler, sweeter song, I'll sing thy power to save. Wash all my sins. Wash all my sins away. Wash all my sins away. Show my sins away. Amen. Hello, good morning, brothers and sisters of Summit Church. My name is Eric Moran, and today I'll be sharing with you a spoken word about the theme of Israel without a king, and I hope you guys enjoy. In those days, there was no king in Israel. Every man did that what was right in his own eyes. The murderer lays in ambush to shed his blood without purpose. The thief plotted his next scheme in order to liberate his victims of their possessions. The liars and manipulators looking for one to swindle. The greed of many filled the streets with pain and suffering and hunger for the meat. Overlooking the needs of others in, in order to abundantly serve self. Parents taking food out of their children's mouths. Children's cursing and disobeying their parents. Everyone did what was right in their own eyes. Loyalty becomes scarce, and the woman wore being a harlot as a badge of honor, saying to self, I have no need other than to embellish myself with the finest things. Everyone big and small disregarded the words of God, the self-righteous looking as if they are blameless, justifying their actions because of their circumstances or how they were raised or what they were taught, forgetting that we have an overseer, forgetting that we have a king on a throne, forgetting how he delivered us out of Egypt and the wilderness, forgetting how he shined his light into our depraved darkness, forgetting that he sent his son for us, forgetting the gruesome death he died for us, forgetting how he was hung for our transgressions, and we will always forget and do what is right in our own eyes if we do not fix our eyes on the true king of Israel. The one who has taken God's wrath from us and loves us dearly, the meek lamb of God who rules and took away the sting of death, the one who is the beginning and the end and who has ruled before there was anything, rules presently and will rule when this life is no more, our savior that every knee will bow to and tongue will confess that he is Lord, the king of all kings, Jesus Christ of Nazareth, a king that doesn't rule with a fist of iron, but a hand of help, love, and servitude the only king whose name, kingdom, and rule is holy perfection. I pray, plead, and beg we don't ever forget that he reigns and resort to doing what is right in our own eyes again. Thank you. Jesus bled and died for me. I see his wounds, his hands, his feet, my Savior on that cursed tree. His body bowed. And drenched in tears, they laid him down 
and Joseph to the entrance sealed by heavy stone, Messiah still and all alone. Praise the name of the Lord our God. Oh, praise his name forevermore. For endless days we will sing your praise. Oh, Lord, oh, Lord our God. the third at break of dawn the sun of heaven rose again oh trample death where is he hoisting the angels roar for Christ the King Together, oh, praise the name. Oh, praise the name of the Lord our God. Oh, praise his name forevermore. For endless days we will sing your praise, oh, Lord, oh, Lord. In robes of white, the blazing sun shall pierce the night, and I will rise among the saints, my gaze transfixed on Jesus' face. Thank you, worship team. Once again, want to please sit down. Please sit down. Please sit down. Uh, I want to welcome you again for coming. I don't know if I mentioned it earlier. My name is Roy. I'm one of the deacons at Summit Church of Homestead. I want to go over a couple quick announcements. Then we're going to bring a young man up here to talk to you. First announcement, of course, is our communication cards. Right, they're on the back of the chair. If you're new, if you're interested in baptism. If you're interested in becoming a member, if you have prayer that you want, please fill out the card, throw it in the offering basket when they come by at the end of the service. Uh, we do want to hear from you. This is the way we communicate here, and somebody will get in touch with you. Second announcement is our worship and prayer night. It's moved from October 26th to October 25th at 7 p.m., Please put that on your calendar. It'll be an awesome night of just, just prayer and worship and being in, in God's presence. And I would like to bring Owen Isom up.
How's everyone doing? So we have a mission trip coming up, the young adults group, um, over to the northwest coast of Florida, over in Perry, Florida. Um, and so we have a couple announcements on that. Um, the first being the donations for it. Um, we have an Amazon wish list. Um, and so we have our supplies um, list. You can find it. If you have questions about it, about it you can see Molly. Um, but the QR code there um, is our Amazon wish list and so stuff we're looking for for donations for the trip. Um, you can scan the QR code or you can see Molly. Um, and if you are interested in volunteering on the trip, um, I believe there is a limited number of spots available. So see Julianne and she can give you the information on that. And the donation locations, if you have supplies to drop off, would be here on Sundays for Colonial Christian School, First United Methodist, or you can also, once again, see Molly. So, thank you. Thanks, Owen. And our young adults, the young, being able to do that. Please volunteer, even if you want to do it in your old age, <laughs> okay? Because they do need help. Lastly... The kids are dismissed. You've got two minutes. Greet somebody, all right? And then we get to hear Pastor Alex.
Good to see you. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, everybody. Would you please do me a favor and open up your Bibles to Psalm chapter 23? I know most of us, a lot of us use electronic devices, so you can, I guess you have the option of not turning but scrolling. I listened to this leadership podcast by a man named John Maxwell, and one of the things that they say in the podcast, it says, every person deserves to be led well. That's kind of why they do what they do. Unfortunately, it's not our experience in life that we're led well. Often we wish we had different bosses. We, have diff- we wish we had different pastors. Some of us feel we, had di- we wish we had different spouses. But today, I hope that we see in God's word that above any earthly leader that we have is that we have a good shepherd for our souls. Would you bow your heads and pray with me? Father, we do today what the church has done for thousands of years. We gather to sing songs to you and to one another, to encourage one another, Father, as we hear our voices and we hear this instruments praise you. We take time now out of our lives that may feel like our own personal hurricanes and find ourselves hopefully under the peace and rest of your holy word that gives us direction when we feel, seem to lack it. Father, what we have not, please give us. And what we are not, please make us. For the sake of Christ, in his name we pray. Amen. Amen. Praise God for our brother Eric Luku that brought God's uh, word today and spoken poetry, the big theme of judges, that in those days there was no king in Israel and everyone did what was right in their own eyes. By God's grace, he's provided for us a king, a king that is on an everlasting throne and his name is Jesus. And I pray today that as if you hear God's word, that you would uh, listen to it, not just to be hearers but to be doers and to, that something would happen within you, that you would feel the drawing of God in your heart and, and move towards him. That regardless of everything that's happening and so many things falling apart, that today you would be made whole through Christ. For the next few weeks, we're going to be going through Psalm chapter 23. And my hope is that we would be reminded, certainly, because it's a very common, common psalm, But maybe we will also be informed and learn something about the character of God in our lives. And I'm convinced that if you are not going through trouble today, uh, just hold on. Trouble will find you. At the same time that we go through trouble, we have a good shepherd. Would you read with me in verses 1 through 3? This is from the English Standard Version, Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Some of you want to keep going, huh? Well, brothers and sisters, it's one thing to know the psalm. I, pr- I pray today you'd know the author. We start by having to define what the word shepherd is because it's the noun that's in front of us. Webster gives us this definition. It's a, a shepherd is a guard and a guide of sheep. But it can also mean, a, a, it could be a verb, to shepherd, which would mean to guard and to guide. You can say in English that we are being shepherded well by our leaders 
or even our parents when they are guarding and guiding us in the ways of God. In ancient Israel, shepherds were those lowly men that would tend to the dumb sheep so that the, the flock would be healthy and not devoured by the wolves on the outside. That's the shepherding we have in mind, and that is the job description of the good shepherd that the psalmist David has in mind also. Well, when we look at shepherding, there's something that's happening here in the relationship between David and the shepherd. It's, it's, he tells us who this shepherd is. Well, church, you tell me, who is the shepherd? The Lord. Most of your Bibles have the word Lord all in caps, doesn't it? Capital L, capital O-R-D, even though the O-R-D are a little bit smaller in the font. Anytime you see that in translations of the Bible, it's giving you the proper name of God. It's not the title of God like Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father. Um, it, but rather, it's the actual name of God, the I Am. It's the name that God told told to Moses when Moses said, I'm going to go to Egypt and tell Pharaoh to let my people go, but who do I say sent me? He says, tell them the I am sent you, the self-existing one, the I exist. You see, our God is not a shepherd that, is, that was created. Our God is the self-existing one. Interestingly enough, the, the, the role of a shepherd would normally be played by the youngest in the family, the one that would be considered the least. Yet we have here the self-existing one, the uncaused first cause, God Almighty taking on one of the lowest forms and responsibilities that humans can have, a shepherd. The same God that hung the stars in the sky like Christmas ornaments is the same God that leads little Susan, little James. You see, what should take us back from this passage that most of us know by heart is not just how great God is. That's true. But what should take us back is that this great God chooses to be among us, a shepherd. Uh, Preacher Montgomery Boyce says it like this, quote, The great God of the universe has stooped to take just such care of you and of me. You see, most, most faiths accept that God is great. They accept that there is some great being out there that's governing the world somehow. Some say that there's great beings, plural, that are governing. That there's some, some sort of energy that we can feel is what many faith, uh, faith systems have. Some call it energy. Others call it, like the Greeks, logos, logos. We translate it the word. In science, they call it the uncaused first cause. Because in case you haven't noticed in the science world, many evolutionary scientists are starting to accept that there had to be something that started this thing. But what makes Christianity preposterous isn't that we believe in a great God. It's that we believe that this great God is personal. Think of the foolishness of such claims. That there's a great God that flung all the stars in the sky and created the world with the word from his mouth. Yet this good God wants to know you, not the person next to you. We know that's crazy. You. What an incredible claim. Christians sing songs like, and he walks with me, and he talks with me, and tells me I am his own. And the world looks at you like, look at this fool. This fool crazy. And yet we say, 
if I'd be crazy for anything, I'd be crazy for Christ, the one that gave his life for me. Everybody's crazy for something or someone. Don't act. If we just rolled the film of your life, you seen you act crazy for something or someone. I'm going to spare you that today. If we'd be crazy for anything, be crazy for the one that made us, for the good shepherd that loves us. Yet still we have rebuttals and we have claims and questions that try to poke holes in our system. And people will say, how could a loving God allow so much evil in the world while, not, while at the same time those people that bring this question fail to acknowledge that this good God has also done so much good? But it's one-sided. And people that don't understand God will blame God for problems and then give themselves credit for the good. Yet the church has it upside down. And in this case, it's good to be upside down. That any problems that are in this world are caused because of our sin and our issues. And every good and perfect gift is from above. You see, in many of those cases that people deny the shepherding of a good shepherd, of a good God, it's not the sheep that accuse God of being a poor shepherd, but rather the wolves who hate him or goats that are not under his care. But sheep know his voice and know he is good. King David knows it too. Which is why he says maybe the most incredible word in the entire psalm. The Lord is my shepherd. Just say this to yourself. The Lord is my shepherd. You belong to him. He belongs to you, church. And somehow, as dumb sheep, we consistently find ourselves wandering from the green pastures into these places with, uh, with food that only lasts for a day. Trying to find our fulfillment in substances and in people and in our own accolades, missing out on the face of Jesus. Single folk looking for someone to come and give them direction. Spouses without leadership looking for someone to lead them. Sinners looking for someone to bring them comfort and to bring them love. We've all searched. And we've all searched in wrong places. It's like the prophet Isaiah says, all like sheep have gone astray. And all have turned our own way, looking for a shepherd of our souls in the wrong places. So where do you find this comfort, church? I'm glad you asked. We find this comfort in our shepherd, my shepherd, and his name is Jesus. He is my shepherd. He is our shepherd. He is our good shepherd. And brothers and sisters, if, if he really is your shepherd, why do we want so much else besides him? Is that right, English? Did I say that right? Why do we want so much more? Why do we want something else besides Jesus? Why, though he supplies our every need, we still want so many other things. You see, it says in the, in the psalm, the Lord is my shepherd. What does it say next? I shall not want. It, it, the New Living Translation says it like this, and it captures the meaning. The Lord is my shepherd. I have all that I need. In other words, he's not, he's not telling us uh, we, we, that I shall not want as a directive. 
He's saying we have all, the, all we need, that we don't, shouldn't want anything else. We don't want anything else. Our soul longs to be filled by the only one that can fill it. And even though we're going to lose people on this planet, and we're going to lose ourselves and our health is going to decay, we still have everything we should ever want in our precious Jesus. Now, it doesn't mean that we can't want things. If I could say it like this, it means that our wants are satisfied. A friend of mine this week was reminding me of something I did 20 years ago. That men show love to each other by roasting each other. And it seems that I'm roasted all the time. He was reminding me of 20 years ago when I was young 20s where he tasked me to watch his dog while he went away on vacation. Well, I blame first, I blame the whole situation on him because he did not give me parameters and instructions on how to care for this dog and assumed that a young 20 year old boy would know how to care for something else. Well, I went in and I fed him and I didn't put him back in his kennel. And on the top of his dinner table was this opened bag, I don't know what you call it, of Chips Ahoy cookies, soft chew, the red packet. I don't remember it to this day. He said when he walked into the house, when he came back the next day, he walked into a horror scene. Let's just say that the dog spread his joy through that entire household. Why did this happen? I like to blame him. But the truth is that he left that dog under the shepherding of a terrible shepherd, of an inexperienced shepherd. I, I, I was a hired hand. It wasn't my dog. And so I just I think I've done enough. A brother recently was telling me the story that he let someone else take care of his dog, and he called, hey, did you take care of the dog? Yeah, I took it. Hey, did you take care of the dog? He came back, and the dog wasn't fed. And he left things in his house that he could tell, like, you've, you've done this before. I'm going to see. I'm going to know for sure if they came in. I'm going to put this little thing right here. If it's not moved, I know he didn't do it. And sure enough, things weren't moved. He didn't take care of his dog. That dog went fasting for two days. I don't know if he prayed during that time, but... <laughs> That dog was neglected by, again, a poor shepherd. You see, if God is our shepherd, he has personal interest in us individually. Would you turn your Bibles to John chapter 10? If you don't have this part of your Bible highlighted, just put, it might say it in the title, the good shepherd. And Jesus is speaking to these religious leaders and calling himself the good shepherd. John chapter 10 and verse 11 in particular, he gives us insight of how he cares for his own people. I'm going to start in verse 11. God says, I am the good shepherd. A good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. This is where I was. He who is a hired hand is not a shepherd who does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming, and leaves the sheep and flees. The wolf snatches them and scatters them. He flees because he is a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. I am the good shepherd, Jesus says. I know my own, and my own know me, just as the Father knows me, and I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. Brothers and sisters, heads up for a second. What, what more does God need to do for you to show you he cares? What more does he need to do? Because we, when we show our discontentment 
with the things God has given us already. What does that show about your attitude towards Jesus and him giving his life for you? What more do you need but eternal life in Christ Jesus? What I find is that some of the biggest complainers that I've encountered on this earth live in the biggest houses. And some of the most grateful souls I've ever met live with the most modesty. Why is that? It seems that the more that we have here on earth, the harder it is to see God. Which is why Jesus consistently through his time here on earth condemned the rich. Not because they had much, but because they could not see beyond their much. Can you see beyond it? Is Christ enough for you? By God's grace, our good shepherd is not some 20-year-old novice that doesn't know how to care for the sheep that he's been entrusted with. The Lord is our, our shepherd. The Lord is our shepherd. The Lord is our shepherd. I shall not want. Well, I think he answers the question, how does he shepherd us in the next section? He makes us lie down in green pastures, is what it says, and leads me beside still waters. He restores my what? My soul. He makes us lie down in green pastures, and he leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. Uh, um, for the sake of teaching, I'm going to group green pastures and still waters together so that you see the bigger picture of what the psalmist is telling us. But first, let me give you two warnings of how this passage has been interpreted, not wrongfully, but skewed. First, we can focus on the he makes us lie down. He makes us lie down. And we can overemphasize the part of God's sovereignty in that he makes us lie down, which is so true, but underemphasize the green pastures, which is what he provides. What's in focus here is not the makes us lie down. It's what he gives, the green pastures and the still waters that the Lord provides. Second warning is that we can over-spiritualize this. We can over-spiritualize it so much that we miss out on the reality that he does provide physically for his people. He physically and tangibly provides for us, not just spiritually, but physically also. And I think this supports the verse before where he tells us we have all we need. I shall not want. He's given us all that we need. We can trace this thinking um, everywhere in Scripture, in Psalms before and after, from the book of Genesis to where Jesus walked the earth and to how he's going to provide for us in the future. Let me give you a few here. You don't have to turn there. Psalm 37, verse 25, he says, I've been young and now I'm old. Amen, somebody? Yet I have not seen the righteous forsaken, watch this, or his children begging for bread. Matthew chapter 6 says this, tangible needs. Jesus says, look at the birds of the field. I'll just paraphrase it. Look at the birds of the field. Don't worry about life, right? Look at the birds of the field. They go and they fly around. And they don't worry about what they're going to eat. And then his conclusion is in a rhetorical question. How much, how much more precious, how much more valuable are you, brothers and sisters, than the sparrows? If you're wondering, uh, worrying about your future and how God's going to provide, go for a walk today and look at the birds that have no worry because God cares for them. How much more valuable are you than they? 
The second illustration in Matthew 6 is look at the lilies of the valley. Look at the flowers of the field. And he says, are they not clothed with, clothed with more splendor than Solomon? Are you not more valuable than sparrows? Are you not more precious than flowers? He provides for us tangibly. And then the words of the Apostle Paul in Philippians 4.19 says this, And my God will supp supply, listen, every need of yours. Every need of yours according to the riches and glory in Christ Jesus. Well, somebody said, well, why hasn't God provided for me? Sir, ma'am, you're blind. And I don't mean that to be mean. You're just blind. And the scales have to fall off your eyes. You have to walk and look around at the way God has blessed you. Because he has given us so much. And maybe you say, well, I'm still lacking. There is also that you're the variable. Blocking things from happening. He clearly provides because you're here today. Hello. You're here. He's provided for you and he's not done with you. And I can hear the skeptic's voice. The high school students I teach. The college students I've been around. But then why are there people that are still hungry throughout the world? I said, bro, stop. You, you haven't even seen hungry people. You're going off of what you saw on some kind of pamphlet. Or what you see on YouTube. I've seen these people. I've seen the hungry. I've had conversations with people that were, were, didn't know what they were going to eat that day. And I've seen people that are the greatest gluttons in particularly this country. And I don't mean just food. And I find that the hungry in Haiti... And the hungry in Jamaica that I have spoken to has led them to greater faith than what I've ever seen with people that have so much. And you know what these people do when you speak to them? From the youngest to the oldest? They praise Jesus for the green pastures and the still waters that God has provided them. I don't know about you, but I want things for my family. I want stuff. Thinking about it this week, talk to my friends often. Man, why do we still not have? <laughs> A dear brother told me over lunch several weeks ago, he says, man, it's, I think it's the way God keeps us relying on him. I want things for my family that sometimes they don't even want. But yet the green pastures and the still waters that the Lord has provided for me should be enough. And brothers and sisters, in my right mind, they are. They are. Now, he doesn't just provide physically. Of course, he provides spiritually, which is a greater truth than the physical. Uh, Job says in Job 24, he says, Father, though you slay me, my hope is in you. Though you take everything that I have, my hope is in you. Uh, we have green pastures and still waters always in our precious Jesus. You see, 2,000 years ago, our precious Jesus stepped onto this planet to give his life for sinners that don't deserve it. And he gave his life as the sinless life. The life that we are required to live that we could never live. And because God is so good in sending this perfect son, he didn't send them just to die for, just to die for the best people. He died for me. The worst of people. The one that desperately needs great grace. And Jesus died there considering all the sheep that the Father would give him. And the people in this room today, he gave his life. For you, this can't get old. This can't get old to us, brothers and sisters. It's the fuel for your life. It's what, it's what propels us to live more like Jesus. 
God forbid we become these Christian Pharisees that think because we give and because we do well and because we loved our neighbor that we will enter into heaven. All of that is filthy. It's rags. It's nothing if you have not the fuel of the gospel of Jesus that he gave his life for sinners like you and me. Not only that, three days later after he gave his life for you, he raised from the dead. He raised from the dead. The tomb is empty. And when the disciples walked into that tomb and saw the empty tomb, they didn't know what was going on. But when Jesus showed up and revealed himself to them, he validated that the life that he lived was really sinless and that he was truly God. That resurrection is guaranteed to all those who put their trust in Christ. This world is, is not our home. Hey, hold on. Listen to that, though, for real. The election's coming up. It, 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 social media is going to be on fire. CNN and Fox are going to have different realities. This world is not your home. Your citizenship is in heaven. That's where your citizenship is. We're not about the politics. We serve one king that promised us the resurrection. Now, until we get there, how do we handle our need? How do you handle the problems that you have? Like, I get, I'm t- you're saying, like, preacher, I know that you're telling me this. I believe it. But, man, like, I have family in Tampa. They're devastated. I have family in North Florida. They're destroyed. Pastor, have you seen what's happening in North Carolina? How dare I go to those people that seem to have lost everything and tell them, oh, there's hope in the future? Don't you think that's careless? Don't you think that's short-sighted? What do we do in this time? You're asking good questions today. I'm glad you asked. Because Matthew chapter 4 gives us some insight on this in verses 1 through 4. If you have your Bibles, would you please turn there? I want you to read what Jesus did when he was hungry. Matthew chapter 4. While you're turning there, I was um, blessed, man, by a Bible study I had on Saturday with some brothers as we were going through Hebrews 4, where we, it says that we do not have a great high priest who's unable to sympathize with our weakness. But he was tempted in every way we were tempted, yet without sin. And I always looked at that passage like, well, he's the high priest interceding for us. But the purpose of the passage was actually to show that the high priest crossed the heavens to us and made himself approachable. That's why the verse right after says, we can boldly approach the throne of grace. And so what's precious about that passage isn't just that Jesus is God Almighty and in heaven but that Jesus descended and showed us how to live. Did you know Jesus was hungry? This is what happens in Matthew 4, verses 1 through 4. How does he handle hunger, physical hunger? Well, Jesus, verse 1, was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And after fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. And the tempter came and said to him, If you are the Son of God, Command these stones to become loaves of bread. Here it is. But Jesus answered him, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. I'll give you this one sentence here. Time without God makes lunchtime your God. Time apart from God makes all the things of the world creep in to become idols in your life. But the more time you spent with God, I'll give you the positive end of it, the more you realize he's all you need. The more time you spend with God, the less you desire the things of the world. 
And we can sing like that old spiritual song. It's I'd rather have Jesus than silver and gold. You know what I was doing on my way over here this morning? I kept just saying, the Lord is my shepherd. The Lord is my shepherd. The Lord is my shepherd. But you know what happened at about the second stop sign? I started thinking about everything I had to do. Anybody's prayers look like that sometimes? The Lord is my shepherd. And at about the 12 stop sign, there's not 12 stop signs in between here, but there's, there was a distance before I made the turn here, and I said, what did, first of all, when did I stop saying the Lord is my shepherd? And what was I just thinking about? I can't even remember about what I was thinking about. The Lord is my shepherd. The Lord is my shepherd. Oh, man, but I got to do this, and I wonder if they did that. Oh, man, I got this meeting after church today. Oh, man, Monday's coming up. And I said, and I'm like, where did the Lord is my shepherd go? And it seems like that's our life consistently. But as I t spend time with God, the things of earth grow strangely dim. What if the answer to our problems here on earth is really as simple as spending time with Jesus? As reading his word. As praying to him. Some of us have dropped that morning devotional. Pick it up. Pick it up again. Some of, us, some of us have stopped that time of prayer. Remember you had it? Remember? You spent that time with Jesus in your backyard or in that room. Start it again. And as you do this, you'll find that he's given you all you need. And you know what's going to happen? The first part of verse 3. He restores my soul. When you think of soul, don't think of something in your body that's floating around. It's not some kind of spirit. Okay, it, it, a, a soul is a tangible thing. In, in the Old Testament, it's the word, the word is used about 755 times. You know what other translation they give us for the word soul? Life. The word life. It's you as a whole. If I could say it the way C.S. Lewis says it, look, he says this. This is, this is worth writing down. You don't have a soul. You are a soul. You have a body. Now think about our brains. We think of it totally different as Americans, don't we? We think we have a soul. There's something inside of us, right? And it's like, man, it, it comes and goes. It's like it's mysterious. But in the Old Testament, it wasn't thought that way. They said, you are a soul. You are a life. This body is something that's going to die. It's going to go away. Hey, you know you're going to die, right? Everybody know that? You say, oh, I don't need to hear it. No, you do because you act like you're not. Everyone's going to die. The soul is going to live forever. Let me say that better. You're going to live forever. We don't have souls. We are souls. And he says he restores it. The word restore means that he brings it back. He turns it around. And so the souls that are tired of dealing with those family members that cause trouble, he'll restore your soul. Spend time with him. The souls that are worried about how they're going to uh, make, uh, make it work next month, spend time with him. He restores your soul. The souls of the young people who are concerned about their future, spend time with him. He restores your soul. The older souls that are struggling with health and the spouses that are struggling with other spouses and those that are struggling with friends and the souls of the rich that have everything on earth but feel so empty, spend time with Jesus. Read his word. Pray to him. He restores your soul. I know we want the restoration. But don't be like that ninth grade girl in my Algebra 2 class when I said, do you really want to succeed? She said, I want to say I do. But the way that I'm acting shows that I don't. Spend time with Jesus and let him restore your soul. Sheep, you're going to lose your way. You know that, right? It happens. This flesh is decaying and it's falling 
away. All like sheep have gone astray, and we need a shepherd's hook to pull us back. And he always brings us back to him. Don't delay that. Don't go off too far where it takes him time to bring you back. Spend time in his green pastures and in still waters. And be face to face with your hypocrisy. You're not as good as you think you are. That's good, and he is too, Alex. He is really good, and we're not, brother. We're not. I, I, I'm not going to put all my business out there and put my daughters out there. You can guess which one did this. <clears throat> well, yesterday we were at a walk for life where we were walking what we thought was a 5K, ended up being a mile, to which God's people said amen. Amen. And during the ceremony, my three daughters were there, and I caught whiff of one of my daughters reprimanding a little kid that was misbehaving during the ceremony. And her words looked something like this. She said to the little boy, listen to your mom so that you'll have long life. Preach, preacher. And after she said it, I could tell that she immediately realized that the verse also applied to herself. So she told the boy the verse and immediately turned to me and said, looks like I'll be dying soon. There's something about the Word of God that recalibrates you, doesn't it? But may we be like this little sinner that takes heed to the Word and realizes, this isn't for him. This is for me. And now, older folk, let's not consider who said that. That isn't for her. That's for you. There's something about the word of God that puts us all at the same playing field, doesn't it? It's like one man said, every man is the same size at the foot of the cross. And that humbles people. We need no, no one to tell us that we're doing a good job. We need to tell someone to tell us we're not doing well and that we need Christ. And when Christ enters your life, he will restore your soul and continue to restore it all the days of your life. Well, I want you to consider a few things today. If you've neglected God's word, get back into it. What I want you to do is uh, maybe you're saying, well, I don't know how. Here's what I'll do. Um, I'll work with our administrator, Susie, and we'll start a little Zoom study on Wednesday morning, early in the morning, probably by 7 o'clock. Somebody say, I started my first two hours by then. Well, amen. We'll do it at 7 o'clock. And we'll walk through the Bible. Just 30 minutes before you get on about your day. If you need it earlier, I'll pray about it. You can spend time in prayer and talk about what that means and what that looks like. But if you're here and you don't know Jesus as your shepherd, would you come forward today and talk about what it means to be a Christian? If you're here and you're saying, I am a sheep, I know Jesus, I follow him, but I've never been baptized. I'm going to do a, a baptism class right at the end of this service. You can come and see me. I'll be over here on this side and talk to you about why we should all be baptized. If you said, I was baptized as an infant, that's all my Catholic folk. I, I've been there. We weren't even really Catholic. We just, that's what we were. That's what I was told I was. Um, if you haven't been baptized as a Christian, Come, let's do the baptism class and take that step towards Jesus, this good shepherd that loves you. I've probably said too much. Let's bow our heads and pray. Father, may your word uh, change us. Man, Father, you're so good. We hear your voice. We know it. And I pray you continue to draw us to you. 
In Jesus' precious name I pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Alex. We are going to have fun in Psalms as we go through this series. Luke, do we have an extra mic? I want to do takeaways. New series, one person on this side. Please give us a takeaway that you took from the service and one person on this side. Yeah, Bill? Anybody over here? Raise your hand. You got anybody? Anybody on the right? Okay, we got a silent crowd today, I guess. Well, I'll give you my takeaway. Right? The more you spend with God, you realize he's all you need. Don't forget that. And then this one is just, the Lord is my shepherd. We belong to him, and he belongs to us. Don't forget that. Deacons, we're now going to, this is time when we take our giving, uh, giving and our offering. At Summit, we want you to know that the, we know the Lord loves the cheerful giver. We don't, you know. We don't expect you to give if you don't feel like giving. But if you do give, give with the, your heart and just let it flow. All right? And I'm going to pray. Please close your eyes. Lord, thank you uh, for everything we have. Thank you for being a loving God and a providing God. Just pray today that today's all about you and it's all about your glory. And thank you, Father, for just loving us and sending your son. And all God's children said, Amen. Oh, Lord, my God, when I some wonder consider all the world thy hands have made I see the stars I hear the rolling thunder Thy path throughout the universe displayed. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to great thou art, then sings my soul, my Savior God, to So, um, some sad news. Um, did you see the family that left that was up front here? That's um, Jose Rodriguez's uh, family. They had uh, his father's in hospice, and they had gotten some bad news. That's why they had to leave. So, let's pray for them right now, all right? So, please close your eyes. Father, Lord, I want to pray for Jose Rodriguez, his family. Um, pray that the father has a relationship with you and that he's going to be with you when the uh, when he passes, but Lord, I pray for strength for them and pray for the church to give them strength and to be there for them. And Lord, just 
wrap your arms around that family and, and look over them, and Father, and just help us to be there for them too. And all God's children said, amen. So almost time to dismiss you, but I want to let you know we're going to have a prayer team up here. If you have any prayer, please come up. Uh, and don't forget, Pastor Alex will be over here to the right for anybody that wants to get baptized. Have a great weekend, right? I know he's not there right now, but he'll be up there in a second. Uh, have a great weekend and, and a good week. Be safe. Go Dolphins!